Okay, we are here with 52 Weeks with Jesus. It's been a minute since we've done one. Um, don't know about you, but I've had a crazy couple of weeks. Really, all of 2020 has been crazy. Um, but I pray that you've had a good week, a good day, uh, that everyone's healthy and safe. And we're going to go with part 27. 52 weeks with Jesus. Um, I would ask for a special prayer request for a um, gentleman that lives in one of our group homes. His name is Timmy. He's had surgery and had some complications from his surgery and needs our prayers uh, to build up strength in his lungs, um, get his bowels moving like they're supposed to after surgery. Um, and I, I, I ask you to call out his name. He needs some prayers. Uh, seems to be headed in the right direction as of the last report I got today or last that I read today about him. Um, but remember him um, and his family, too. Um, I can't wait to see him back with a smiling face. He always does my heart good to see him. Seems like <clears throat> the people uh, doing what I do for a living, the people that live in our homes, just have a special way of when I'm having a bad day or bad week, uh, can really lift my spirits. Um, so remember this man. Uh, 52 Weeks with Jesus, part 27, he is titled The Object of Our Worship. And we're going to look at um, two types of people, actually. And I'm going to read the main um, scriptures here from Luke chapter 18, and it's verses 9 through 14, a very familiar um, parable that Jesus tells. I'm going to read that, and then we'll get into the book. But it starts with verse <clears throat> Luke chapter 18, verse 9. It says, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. There's mistake number one. It says they trusted in themselves. I found that any time I can come up with good ideas or I can feel like I'm on the right path, but when I begin to trust in myself, that's when I begin to fall and fail. But it says here that he uh, told this parable to certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Here's a parable. It says, Two men went into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee, and I'll stop right there because I've learned this. I've, I've always heard publican and, and publican is looked down on by the Pharisees throughout the Bible. What actually is a publican? Well, a publican was a tax collector, and it would have been a Jewish person who was set as a tax collector of over the Jews. So he took the money from the Jews to give to the Romans. So he was kind of like uh, looked upon by his um, Jewish counterparts as a sellout to the Roman society. He, he, uh, and he made a little side profit, I guess, off of taxing his own people for another, um, anyway, side note. Let's get to the, to the actual parable. It says, two men went into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing off would not lift up, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So what we read there is saying we got one who thought he was, in our words, high and mighty, all that, something special. And then you got a person who was humble and realized that they're nothing and both said a prayer but one was kind of haughty and and fancy with his words the other was humble and from the heart which one uh, got their prayers to God which one went away uh, justified so let's get into our book 52 weeks with Jesus the object of our worship it says a tale of two men a minister lives with his family in a comfortable gated neighborhood. At the front of the house are bay windows where the pastor kneels to pray every morning, hoping that his neighbors will see him because he wants to be a witness. The minister says, 
Dear God, I'm so grateful for who I am and what I have. I'm so grateful that unlike so many people, I've never had a drink, I've never smoked, I've never used profanity. I've been faithful to my wife and a good father to my children. I'm just thankful I am not like so many people out there who live such terrible lifestyles and I never will be. And there's a mistake number one is saying I never will be is um, it's very dangerous to say you'll never do this or you'll never do that. Or as a father, let me say this um, of my children. Um, it's, it's very slippery slope, very dangerous to look at somebody else's kids and say, well, my kids will never end up like that. My kids will never be a drug addict. My kids will never go down that road. Um, all we can do is pray. We're all equal at the, at the foot of the cross. We're all human. We're all going to fail. Um, let's get back into the video. On the other side of town, where half of the homes are boarded up, is a dark house without electricity. It smells of urine and vomit. Used syringes are scattered across the floor. In the upstairs room, a man sits in front of a coffee table where a line of cocaine has been sprinkled and scraped. Caught in the grip of addiction, he drops to his knees to begin snorting another line when a flood of conviction breaks through the dam of his heart. Instead of reaching for the syringe, he looks up to heaven and says, Oh God, I am the least worthy person to talk to you. I have made terrible choices and I've suffered the consequences. God, would you please have mercy on me? Two houses, two men, two prayers. One question. In God's eyes, who do you think got up off their knees justified? Do you think it was the one who was proud and said, God, I'm thankful that I've never smoked cigarettes or used profanity, and I've never cheated on my wife, and I never will. I'm, I'm it almost sounds like this guy's trying to tell God just how perfect he is. And then we have an imperfect person who realizes uh, his imperfections and that, and it doesn't necessarily have to be drugs. It can be drugs. It can be alcohol. It can be sex. It can be power. It can be money. It can be a job, whatever it is. It can be sports, whatever it is you put before God. But we have somebody who realizes I have a problem, but God has the answer. I'm not perfect but he is. I am weak, but he is strong. And he goes to God and humbly and honestly says, God, I can't do this. I need you. Who come away justified with their prayer? Just like with the uh, parable there of the Pharisee and the publican. Uh, who come with a prayer from the heart that was for the glory of God rather than the glory of man? It says, this story may be for you. Jesus tells a story in Luke 18 about two men in a similar situation, but with a surprising twist. One man was convinced for the wrong reason he was right with God, but he was wrong. One man was convinced for the right reasons he was wrong with God, and he got right. Jeff Foxworthy has become famous for identifying rednecks. To go into Foxworthy mode, you just might be in this parable if, and I guess he's talking about that you might be a redneck if, but you just might be in this parable if any of the following things are true about you. Do you ever look at people who don't go to church and think you are better than they are because you do go to church and they don't? Do you ever look at people who drink and think that you're better than they are because you don't? Do you ever look at someone who may be living in sexual sin and thank God because you aren't? If so, Jesus is talking to you. And maybe, and this is a big one for me, is don't forget where you came from either. Uh, maybe you don't do all these things, but you were once, if you're saved, you were once a sinner too. Nobody's perfect. And it's easy to sit maybe in the church or sit at home and think about uh, how you've changed and the good things in your life, how God's blessed you and look at the one who's struggling with addiction or struggling with uh, whatever it may be that each person struggles with. But don't forget that you are not perfect and you have those same struggles. You just have Jesus. 
and, and without him, you could very well. I, I just put it back on me because I'm good at putting things back on myself is uh, I can't look down the person who's popping pills and put them down because that was me before I met the Lord. So who am I to look down on them and say that I'm any better than they are? The only difference is I've got Jesus and maybe they don't. Pray for them. Don't lift up self. Lift up others uh, to God. It says, if so, Jesus is talking to you. When you look up to God, you will never look down on others. One man in Jesus' story was rejected by God and the other man was accepted. Why? Because how they looked at themselves. And I said it just a minute ago, at the foot of the cross, all men are equal. Okay, the drug addict, the murderer, the the thief, and the person who tells the little simple white lie, or the person that does something that's uh, we as humans deem little sins. There are no little sins and big sins in the eyes of God. All are the same. I like there's an example one time of skyscrapers, and there's a picture and it shows the skyscrapers, and you'll see. I can do this with my finger or in front of the camera. Be one about this tall, and then the next one's about this tall, and then one here, and one here, and one here, and one here, and one here. And that's how we look at it as humans. Some skyscrapers are tall, some are short, some are in the middle. And that's how we look at sin, too. We seem to want to look at sins as, oh, well, here's this just a little sin. Here's the big sin. I'm not doing the big sin. You know, this little one's okay. Uh, but God's looking down. And if God's look, if you're looking down on skyscrapers, they all look e equal from the top. Uh, you can't tell which one's tallest. They all look the same from the top. That's how sin looks to God. It's all uh, the same to God. So who are we to lift up ourselves and think we're any better than anybody else? Uh, the next topic says, don't bother comparing. In the first century, there were two services every day in the temple when lambs were sacrificed and an atonement was made for sin. The early service started at sunup and the late service started at three o'clock. Each service began outside the sanctuary at the altar where the sacrifice for sins would take place. Trumpets would sound, cymbals would clang, and someone would read a psalm. The priest would then enter the outer part of the sanctuary where he would offer incense and trim the lambs. When he left, anybody could offer prayers, prayers to God. In first century Judaism, the Pharisee was the eagle scout. If anybody was okay with God, one might reason it must be the Pharisees. They were the ones who were raised from birth to know the law, live the law, learn the law, practice the law. Uh, but then it says here, Pharisee has a negative connotation today, but not so 2,000 years ago. You could have taken a vote and any Pharisee would have overwhelmingly been chosen as the one who would have been most likely to know God, meet God, and be right with God. The Pharisee in Jesus' story compares himself with those he thought were beneath him, extortionists, adulterers, and tax collectors. He let God know that, unlike those slack he let God know that unlike those slackers, he fasted more than was required and tithed on more of his property than he was required. He thought he could look up to God and look down on others. C.S. Lewis wisely said, a proud man is always looking down on things and people, but as long as you're looking down, you can't see anything that is above you. And that's, that's a, good, a good quote because as long as we're looking down on everybody else, how can we look up to the one we're supposed to be looking up to. We're not supposed to look down on anybody. Uh, we're, all, we're all sinners. We all come short of the glory of God. We all need grace. We all need mercy. So we all need to have our eyes focused on the Lord. Um, I don't have time. This may sound kind of strange, selfish. I don't know, but this is just how I feel. I don't have time to worry about my position as compared to you, 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 or you. My position is between me and God, and I need to make sure I am where I need to be with God and then help others get where they need to be with God. It's not a competition between me and you, okay? So I should never think that I'm better than you or, or that 
thank God that I don't have to go through what you're going through or I don't struggle with what you struggle. You don't struggle with what I struggle. We all have our own struggles. Like I said, we're all equal at the foot of the cross and we all need grace and mercy. Um, see yourself correctly. These two men could not be more different. A Pharisee was regarded as being as different from a tax collector as the Pope would be from a pimp. There's a, a sentence you won't hear often in a, in a Bible book. <laughs> a Pharisee was regarded as being as different from a tax collector as the Pope would be from a pimp. Not only did the tax collector not give any money to the temple, but he stole from the people who went there. We are told that he stood far off. He was expected to. No one would have anything to do with him. When the Pharisee would stand in the center of the court, the tax collector slipped in the back, standing in the shadows. This man is seeing himself correctly. Do you know why? You will see yourself correctly only when you see God correctly. When you see God correctly, you will understand that only God is perfect and no one else is. Uh, the pastor, we, sometimes I think we, we tend to put our pastors up on pedestal and I love my pastor to death. Um, I, 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 I feel he preaches the truth. I feel that he is a good friend to me. I feel that he will tell me when I'm right, tell me when I'm wrong, but we don't need to put our pastors up on a pedestal. They're just a man too. Um, I believe it was um, Paul one time where he got, they got shipwrecked and he got bit by a viper that jumped out of the fire and he slung it off and they all looked at him like he was a god and he was like, don't, don't look at me like that. I'm flesh just like your flesh. There is but one God. And sometimes we, we view that incorrectly and we put people up on pedestals just like we put people down in gutters. Um, where were we? When this man says, be merciful to me, talking about the um, publican, he doesn't use the normal word for mercy. The word here goes back to the Hebrew word kapoor, which means atonement, as in Yom Kippur, which means the day of atonement. The word atonement means to cover. What this man said was, God, I'm admitting what you already know is true about me. See, God already knows whether, whether we say we're this great thing and we don't do this, we don't do that, or whether we're like the publican and come humbly and honestly before God. Uh, nothing shocks him because he already knows. He knows our heart. He knows how we live day to day. He knows how we live behind closed doors. Uh, God, I'm admitting what you already know is true about me. I am a sinful man with a sinful heart. God, will you cover for me? This is all that God needed and wanted to hear from either one. God wants to hear us confess. God wants to hear us ask for help. God knows that we're not going to be perfect. Uh, but that doesn't give us a reason to act like we are because we all need it. See yourself clearly. One man said he was innocent, but he went home guilty. One man said he was guilty, but he went home innocent. I imagine the conversation in the temple court that day might have gone differently. The Pharisee should have walked over to the tax collector and said something like, what are you doing here? I've never seen you before. You know, I'm a tax collector and I rip people off for a living. God has finally showed me what I am and who I am, and I'm embarrassed to be here, but I realize I need God to have mercy on me. That is why I'm here. The Pharisee might reply, really? That's why I'm here too. The tax collector would be marveled. Wait a minute. You're religious. You're spiritual. You're a Pharisee. You've never done any of the things that I've done. You're not the person that I am. The Pharisee would reply, yeah, but the problem is I'm proud, arrogant, judgmental, and self-righteous, and I need the mercy of God. Let's make a deal. You don't think that you're not good enough for God, and I won't think that I'm too good for God. Let's pray for each other. That's how it ends, and that's what we're supposed to do. Uh, we're not supposed to think, just like we shouldn't feel that whatever God, God can cover mounds and mounds and mounds and mounds of sin. Uh, we've never done anything. I've never gone too far that God can't reach down and pull you out and pull you to him. Uh, 
Uh, but just on the flip side, we can't get heady and high-minded and think that we're above reproach or that we're above uh, failure or we're above falling victim to sin because that, that gets to be a dangerous spot that we find ourselves in. And the thing is, we all need to come together and we need to pray uh, for the the one who is out in drugs and alcohol and 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 uh, the murderers and the ones in prison and, and all these that society deems or, or Christians, let me say, deems as the bad people. But we need to pray for ourselves too because we're not perfect. The church is full of imperfect people that need grace and mercy. Me being number one, Paul said he was the chief of all sinners. Well, if he was the chief, I guess I'm second in line, okay? Because I fall daily, and I need God to lift me up. I need that grace. I need that mercy just as much as the next person. And if I ever get to the point where I don't think I need it, that's when I need to check up because something's wrong. So that is part 27, the object of our worship. Uh, next go around when we get together, and hopefully it won't be so few and far between for the next time. We are going to do part 28, which is entitled The Grace Giver. The Grace Giver. And if you want to read ahead some scriptures, the main scripture for the Grace Giver is going to come from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Luke 15, verse 11 through 32. Uh, some secondary scriptures to go along with it are Psalms or Psalm. Uh, me and my mom had a little, well, we didn't have a debate. I just had to set her straight. Uh, Psalms is a book of Psalms. One Psalm is a Psalm without an S at the end. That's a little side note, a little inside joke between me and my mother. Uh, Psalm 103, verse 1 through 14. Also read Psalm 78. Verses 32 through 39. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 14 through 16. And Lamentations chapter 3, verses 19 through 24. And that's the grace giver. We'll do that next time uh, we get together. I hope you all have. A blessed rest of the week. I almost said west. Blessed rest of the week. Um, have a good, safe weekend. Stay safe. Wear your mask if you're in Alabama like me, my Ivy said. And let's get this coronavirus stuff over with and a thing of the past. Uh, but most importantly, stay in the word. Uh, it's important because this thing right here is playing out right in front of us. And a lot of people uh, are failing to realize that. So love y'all. We'll see you next go round. Thank you for tuning in with us.